Okay, we've got all these speakers. 6.33. Let's check if there's someone else trying to get in. No, it not looks good. Right, let's make a start. Uh, thanks everyone for coming this evening. My name's Russell Wynn. I'm manager of the England Curly Recovery Partnership. And I'm going to be chairing this session this evening, uh, which is focused on the DEFRA Farming in Protected Landscapes uh, program and those projects specifically that are engaged in curly uh, conservation for part or all of the project. Um, thanks everyone for coming, particularly thanks uh, to those of you that have agreed to share uh, your knowledge of your various projects. I know they're at different stages. Some of them have already had a year uh, of, of active work. Others are uh, literally just at the gestation stage and haven't been submitted as a formal proposal. But I think nevertheless, it's a really good opportunity to share experiences uh, and tips. And the, uh, as I'll say in a minute, the FIPL program has got another 18 months or so at least to run. So opportunities for those not yet engaged in a FIPL project or a proposal to, to, to think about it. Just in terms of housekeeping, so we're on Zoom. Uh, we are recording this meeting this evening uh, and assuming it all goes to plan, then we'll put it up as a Curly Recovery Partnership blog with some summary notes um, as well in due course. Um, please stay muted. Uh, it's all very polite at the minute and it's great sound quality. So thank you everyone for that. Um, we'll have plenty of chances for, for questions after each talk and a, a Q&A session at the end. Just to introduce the Curly Recovery um, Partnership. So we've been going for about 18 months now. Uh, we were set up in early spring 2021. Um, we've got over 350 members in our network. If you're on uh, the meeting this evening and you're not part of our network and you would like to be, then drop me an email via the Curly Recovery Partnership um, website. Uh, we have nine steering group members. Uh, let's just do a test of the... Um, screen sharing and I'll bring that up so that one there and if I go to view full screen so we have um major landowning uh, interests in the Duchy of Cornwall um Tom's here from Bolton Castle Estate uh we've also got the uh, large environmental NGOs such as the RSPB WWT um BTO uh, Game and Wildlife uh, Conservation Trust Natural England as the statutory nature conservation body, and then Curly specific NGOs in the form of Curly Action and Curly Country. So you can see from that that it's a, a really um, broad partnership, and that's one of its um, strengths, I think. We have a, a very capable chair in Mary Colwell, who's on the call tonight, and many of you will be um, familiar with. And really what the Curly Recovery Partnership is doing is trying to bring together and help galvanize a lot of the curly conservation activity that's happening across England. There's a very big program of activity that's going on across the country at the minute. And what we're trying to do with our network is make sure that people are informed of the latest developments and aware of all the opportunities and activities and that we avoid duplication and link people together um, across the country and between uh, countries as much as possible. We've got a series of working groups that have been looking at various issues around um, curly conservation. We know that in this country, the big issue is low productivity, uh, primarily due to predation and losses due to agricultural grass cropping op operations. And we've had a couple of working groups that are looking at how we can mitigate that through agri-environment schemes. And I think it's fair to say that over the last 18 months, one of our frustrations has been that we haven't had much um, success in influencing the new DEFRA agri-environment scheme, which is the environment um, environmental Land Management Scheme, or ELM. Um, we had high hopes for it. It hasn't delivered much for Curly, if anything, so far. Uh, a lot is being pinned on the local nature recovery middle tier of ELM, uh, but obviously in the current political climate, there's a lot up in the air, and we're not sure what DEFRA's uh, future plans and timescale are going to be around that, that programme. So I think in terms of our ability to influence um, the ELM programme, we haven't had much success, but we're not alone in that. Um, I know that there's been a lot of frustration shared amongst other members of our community um, around that. So that has been challenging. Um, we have had greater success in looking at training uh, members of our network. Um, and we had a, a very um, experienced and very effective training working group that enabled us to deliver a series of in the field training workshops last year, one in the uplands, one in the lowlands, that were well attended and, and went really well. Um, and we've delivered a number of online uh, seminars looking at various aspects of curly conservation. This winter, we're going to host another four online seminars in the period from November to February, 
um, looking at issues such as nest cameras, predator control, both lethal and non-lethal, uh, effective land management, habitat management for curlews, and also how to set up and, and operate a local curlew group. We're, we're getting a lot of people interested in doing something in their local area for curlews uh, and bringing together a local curlew group. So we're going to do something on that um, as well. Um, the Curlew uh, Recovery Partnership website, um, www.curlewrecovery.org, that uh, has a lot of resources and information on it, in particular the Curlew Field Worker Toolkit, uh, which is there as a resource really for anyone to go and get information about how to go and survey and monitor curlews. Um, it's got another series of um, uh, fact sheets that are behind a, a firewall, which is effectively me, just to do some checks and balances because they involve nest interventions, but they're for more detailed work like nest cameras and, and um, work involving productivity um, monitoring. We are going to be evolving that talk over the winter and have a wider range of conservation aspects and we'll probably change the name to the Curly Conservation Toolkit or, or something similar, but we'll update network members as we as we do that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing there and go back to the screen. The Farming and Protected Landscapes programme, so it's not an agri-environment scheme programme, so it's not part of the new ELM or the existing countryside stewardship scheme, it's a bit, it's a bit different. And it has nevertheless been quite effective at galvanising smallish projects in protected landscapes, which specifically refers to national parks and areas of uh, outstanding natural beauty, AUMBs, and it's supporting farmers and land managers in those areas to get some work done uh, to benefit a number of different areas. So nature recovery, mitigating climate change, improving public access, improving landscape quality uh, are four areas that, that the FIPL projects particularly are focused on. Um, it originally had a few hard deadlines and was only going to run for a couple of years, but it's been extended to March 24 and it now has a rolling application deadline uh, so people can apply at any time. But that March 24, and it'll be interesting to hear from those of you that are planning to apply soon um, when you talk this evening. That effectively means that if people want to do stuff during the breeding season, then they're going to have to have applications up and running ready for next spring uh, because the programme as it stands at the minute is due to finish in March 2024. So capital works and, and groundworks could be done in winter 23, 24, but it wouldn't enable, as I understand it, people to do work in a second year in the summer, in, in spring, summer 24. Um, but I'd be interested to hear if anyone's got any intel as to whether that is going to be extended. I have heard positive noises, both from the people involved and from DEFRA about the programme uh, and that it may be extended into the longer term. But as I say at the moment, uh, I think it's just a case of, of waiting and seeing. Um, I'm not going to say much more about FIPL because we'll hear a lot more about it from those uh, actively involved in the in the different projects. Just in terms of the agenda this evening, we've got a really nice mix of, of people from across the country. Um, so we're going to start off in Nidderdale, move across to the Yorkshire Dales, uh, and then over to the Southern Lake District, and then hopping across to Boland, down to the Peak District, and finishing up in Dartmoor um, National Park. I'm planning to have a comfort break at around a quarter to eight, eight o'clock. We'll see how we're getting on. Uh, it does normally finish at nine. If we can finish before, then great. So it's getting quite late, but it just depends. I don't want to restrict if there's lots of discussion and questions. I am proposing that we have uh, time for questions at the end of each talk because we've got, I think it's half a dozen talks. People may have forgotten by the end of the session you know, what they wanted to ask or the content of some of the talks. So at the end of each short presentation, we'll give people opportunities to ask questions of the, of the presenters um, and of anyone else involved. Now, I should just say we've got several other members of the CRP um, steering groups, as well as Mary, who's the chair. Um, we've got Tom Ward Powlett at Bolton Castle Estate on. Uh, I'm just seeing if we've got any other steering group members on at the minute. Mike Shermer from RSPB. Uh, and they're the ones that I can see at the minute. So there's also uh, three other members of the steering group and Mary as chair who can help answer questions as well if I'm left floundering. All right, so it's 6.42. Um, I think we're pretty much on time. So Clive and Jackie, are you happy to kick off with yours? So when you're ready, if you go across to sharing your screen, and then if you unmute yourselves and uh, you're good to go whenever you're ready. Okay. All right, so we're up and running. Yeah, looks good. Lovely. Okay. 
Yes, next one, Jackie, <laughs> please. <clears throat> right. Um, okay. Um, it became clear to me, living in the Dale, this bit of the Dale, that um, the curlews were not breeding as successfully as I would like, but we have a, a good local population. Um, so we needed, to, first of all, to, dis to establish what the breeding success was. Um, and also to try and um, work out the relative um, importance or contribution to the poor breeding success made by predation and modern agriculture. So that's essentially it. Um, so stage one was the first year and that's to work out what's going on uh, and try and work out uh, the relative importance of predation and farming. And then uh, this autumn, we're going to take these, Jackie's done all the analyses, and we're going to take these results back to the farmers and landowners and try and discuss how we can press forwards with uh, curlew um, favourable management of the, of the land. Um, it's an area of, uh, should we have the next one? Yeah, this is the, um, the area. It's... Uh, 428 he hectares, um, 10 landowners, including myself, uh, six uh, proper farms, um, and we've recruited 26 volunteers that work in teams uh, this year to carry out the survey, um, which began in March and ended at the end of July, um, looking at particularly at predation and farming practice. Um, the average nest field size was 2.5 hectares. Uh, we only got one chick that we know for sure fledged, but around the fringes there's possibly um, five that are fledged, given that one chick per brood has survived, but uh, we can't be sure of that. So uh, pessimistically, we've just had one successful fledging, optimistically potentially six. Um, it's uh, a grassland area, stock farming, sheep and cattle. Um, it's mainly permanent improved grassland. There's uh, odd bits of uh, hilly stuff that's uh, um, rough pasture and there's also rush pasture. Um, bit of woodland, uh, how much is that? 11% of the project area and then um, yeah, farm buildings, etc. So the average uh, field size of the project area is 1.5 hectares. And the interesting thing is that the birds select, generally select the bigger fields to nest in because the average uh, nest, uh, nest field that we saw on the previous slide was 2.5 hectares. Uh, so that, I suppose, is not a surprise. Um, Okay, this is the, um, the different colours, uh, the, the areas that have been allocated to different teams of surveyors. They've been recruited uh, a variety of people, some keen uh, birders, others um, outright amateurs. Um, and um, their availability has been patchy at times because they go off on holiday and stuff like that things that normal people do. So the, the data hasn't uh, always been, uh, what's the word, as complete as, the, as we'd like. So um, within those limitations, um, thanks, we carried out the, the survey. Um, to train these people, we had a, a couple of workshops and essentially what we, we wanted them to do was to, um, work out what was happening on the ground by studying the curly behavior remotely. So we, we, we discouraged the walking of fields other than across established footpaths and most of the, um, the data was uh, recorded um, from footpaths and um, roads and lanes. Um, and um, of course there were hot times when we wanted them to visit more frequently than uh, than um, the once a week, and that was uh, when we were trying to work out what was happening with chicks, etc. Um, next one, please. Um, 
Right, so these are the results in that area. Um, we recorded 26 territories. Um, 25 um, of the first nests hatched. Uh, we lost five nests um, to uh, various things. Um, and there were four second nests. In total, we had 24 nests hatched. And as, as I said, there was only one chick fledged. This is the, the map showing the individual territories throughout the, the project area. Um, and as you can see, they're quite densely packed. Um, and there's some um, places where there's quite a bit of competition between the pairs of curlews um, for, for territory. Um, right, so where we got to? Um, yes, the preferred habitat was uh, short grassland. Um, typically, it would be um, a field that had been grazed in the spring by livestock. Um, and then ideally, the livestock would have been moved out and the field shut up for silage. And during that period, the birds would have um, nested and incubated. And during the incubation, of course, the grass would grow from relatively short sward, I don't know, 10, 15 centimeters up to a, a foot high. Um, and the chicks were then hatched into um, quite deep grass. Um, now we noticed that um, they avoided nesting in heavily stocked fields. Um, and they, um, when stock was moved around, they, they were often displaced from uh, the field that they appeared initially to have chosen to another field. Uh, so that their nesting was often delayed. Um, now there's an observation we made was that that um, females did most of the incubation in the daylight and the males spent their time chasing off predators and fighting off neighboring males. And um, I learned subsequently from reading the literature that in fact what happened at night was that the males uh, carry, the males took over the incubation and the females would go off and feed during the night. Um, so next, um, our incubation period, um, once the clutches have been laid, um, began in late April and um, carried on through to the hatching in, in early June. Um, and we got, um, we had good success uh, as far as hatchings concerned. Um, five nests were lost to agricultural activity, and four of them went off and had another go, uh, laid another clutch. Um, and because of disturbance by uh, heavy stocking regimes, especially sheep, um, about a quarter of the pairs didn't manage to start incubating at the date when they would presumably have chosen to on the 22nd of April. And um, they started um, a week, generally a week later than the, than the bulk of the, of the curlews. And of course, the pairs who lost their nests um, generally relayed within a couple of weeks, about 10 days. Um, and usually that was within the same the territory that we defined in, in the initial observation period for that pair. Um, so um, we were surprised that we lost very few nests to predation. Now, in terms of predator control, we did hammer the uh, carrion crows quite heavily. And we certainly dispatched about, we, we know about 26 that were either trapped or shot uh, in our area. Um, but um, we didn't uh, attempt any other predator control. Um, 
apart from foxes, um, which we can probably get on to there. Um, yeah. Yes, what's the next one? Oh, sorry, we got yeah. the, we got the uh, what's the next bit? Um, yeah. Um, it is further on, so it's just, I don't know if I want to carry on with it. Okay, so go, right. We've got to be in success. Well, where are we? We've got, uh, yes, uh, typically they were predated as they were um, three to four weeks old. Um, and uh, then the remainder of the chicks that were lost were lost to, um, to agricultural uh, activities. Um, and we can go into that uh, later. So uh, again, we get to the success rate. There's only one confirmed chick fledged and that equates to 0.04 chicks per pair. If we look at it optimistically and assume that five further chicks uh, fledged from those pairs that we didn't have a terribly good grip on, um, it would be 0.25 chicks per pair. Yeah. The next one. Um, yeah, this sort of shows the, the breakdown of the, the causes for, um, for loss of, um, of chicks. Um, the pink one in the north is predominantly farming practice, and um, that is the usual things like rolling, chain harrowing, mowing. Um, but a surprising thing that we found was that there was a lot of uh, perturbation of the bird's intent to nest caused by um, overstocking with sheep. Um, and the, the sheep would be moved from field to field um, uh, as they ate the grass. So the birds would then move from the, their traditional nesting field to a, an adjacent one. And then the sheep would move back again and the birds would be moved yet, on yet again. Um, eventually, the three birds in the area to the west of the lane that goes up the middle um, the three territories there, they did actually nest and hatch chicks, but almost as soon as the chicks had hatched, those fields were mowed with, um, were mowed and then uh, collected up with forage harvesters. So none of those survived, even though they finally managed to breed. Um, that so predation, um, foxes seem to be our. Uh, uh, the major uh, predator in our area. Uh, we had a local shoot that used to keep the foxes under control, um, but they haven't been functioning since the onset of the pandemic. And I was speaking to the, the leader of the shoot and he says that it's, it's now almost impossible to get people who, who are interested in uh, predation control. Um, they sit all they want to do is shoot things and they're not willing to come and, and manage the shoot. Uh, so that's why they, they, the foxes got away from them. Um, uh, I lost my pair of curlews on my bit of land to, uh, we're pretty sure it's foxes because we've got a, a trail camera that showed a fox coming through the gate into the field. I think it was 36 hours before the the chicks were killed. So uh, we're pretty sure in my case it was foxes, but foxes are being seen around the area. And this predate this blue area is predation. We really can't accuse modern agriculture in that area of um, destroying chicks because there were no activities there that would in that blue area that um, that you could interpret as um, responsible for chicks. So that area was pre predominantly predation. The one in red to the north was predominantly farming activity. Um, right, so what we want to do next is to find out what compensation is available from FIPL uh, to um, compensate the farmers for loss of good silage and so on from delaying mowing. 
uh, and also have a management scheme to control the excessive uh, stocking and movement of livestock in the in the territories of these birds. And one of the ideas we had that was that we'd try and enlist a curlew officer. He would um, establish which um, fields were the nests were in, discuss with the farmers about avoiding mowing those fields and delay and delaying the mowing of those fields to allow the chicks to to get away. And also, it's it's clear that we need to have. Uh, in much improved predator control, particularly foxes. We seem to be on top of the crows. Next one. Um, right, um, some anecdot anecdotal stuff that you might be able to help us with. Um, we did notice that the, the, the adults would leave the chicks unattended in a field for quite some time, and we recorded an hour and a half. This was my pair of curlews, and they went across the lane to field in a, a field uh, to feed in a field uh, on an adjacent farm where there was it was an in-by field so there was a lot of livestock and I presume a lot of muck and flies and stuff and worms um, and what we've also noticed that if a, a field is next to the nest field with the young chicks in is cut the adults will then take the chicks when they're about two to three weeks old into those freshly cut fields. And they'll spend a few days with the chicks, presumably taking the invertebrates off the swathes of grass and the adults will probe the ground. And then I think after a period of time, the ground dries up, the adults can't probe it anymore. Presumably the chicks have eaten all the invertebrates and then they take them back into the uncut nest field. So we want to use that to try and um, and manage the fields, that activity. Um, now, the other thing is we suspect that the high population that we have in the valley is entirely supplemented by spillover from the adjacent moors. And I don't think that our birds, if they carry on performing like this, are con contributing much at all to the the uh, increase in population in the wider countryside. I think they're probably just um, uh, spending their lives fruitlessly trying to breed and failing and, and then finally dying after a number of years. Um, dispersal flocks, uh, we, we looked at dispersal flocks. They began to appear on the 22nd of June. These were all adults and were a mix of males and females. Um, with no juveniles present. Early in July, the composition of those flocks changed um, to be predominantly males that presumably were males left by females which had deserted their, their broods um, after three or four weeks. And, um, and then they had subsequently lost their, the chicks that they were left looking after. And so they flocked. And then finally, um, what, what, when was that curlew flock? I think it was the end of, end of July. We, we spotted a flock of 70 curlews that actually had juveniles present. Uh, oh, mid-July, mid-July. Uh, uh, but there were only two juveniles so in that flock. So the performance around our area is, must be pretty poor. I think, are we done? Is that it? Yes, that we're all done. So uh, I don't know whether that's all um, old stuff to you, but we've learned an awful lot this year doing this work. Thanks, Clive and Jackie. That's great. Do you want to just shop, uh, stop slide sharing? Brilliant. And then uh, we can see everyone in the screen. So, so we can really... So uh, we've got a few minutes for, for questions, and so I suggest we do a, a bit of Q&A after each um, talk while everything's fresh in the memory. I think that was a really useful opener because it's like a microcosm of the issues affecting curly productivity in most farmed landscapes across England, and your upper productivity value of around 0.25 isn't far off where we are in terms of the national average. So, so the issues that you're mm -hmm. facing are ones that are very common across a lot of England, uh, particularly the sort of lowland and mid-altitudes. Mid 
Um, I think I've got lots of questions, but I'm going to invite other people to uh, to chat. So if you want to ask a question at this stage, if you go to the little toolbar at the bottom of the screen, there's one called reactions with a smiley face. Mm -hmm. and if you click on that, it's a thing called raise hand. So uh, click on that if you would like to ask a question. And the first one I can see with the hand up is Tom, over to you. Don't forget to unmute, Tom. Thanks, Russ. And um, yeah, huge thanks, uh, Clive and Jackie. I thought absolutely fascinating. And I, I've been watching Curly's in Wensdale, you know, as as closely as I can and have time for for a, a few years now. And so much of what you said absolutely, you know, rang so true. Uh, just a couple of things I thought that your twenty second of June, seeing flocks as failed breeders, I, I feel quite strongly that this. Um, correlates almost exactly with the first silage cut and I can almost set my I can guarantee as soon, as soon as I see the silage cutting starting within hours or days we'll have these failed breeders it might be four or five getting together six seven calling over the fields and then you know ultimately you know forming what I think of a flocks of, of failed breeders and, and I'd say often it's a bit earlier than that here but I'd say it's something worth watching out for in future and see if you see the same correlation that I have with as soon as silage has been cut, you will start to see flocks. Um, you're, can I speak now? Is that? Can yeah, can I? You, yeah, to, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I'll totally shut up. Um, the other thing oh, I thought, <laughs> maybe an anomaly with what I've seen, the very high hatching rate and then very high mortality afterwards. I'd, I mean, I would hold out some hope that actually it might be a case of not seeing all the chicks. And I, I'm, I'm not doubting what you're saying in terms of huge losses. But given the survival of eggs to hatching, I think there might be a chance, especially given what you've said about, um, you know, field work and, and the results not being as complete, that there's a bit of a chance there might be more a few more chicks around than you know which are very mobile very quickly than people have been able to monitor so I'd, you know i'm not <laughs> saying it wrong but i'd cross my finger and hope there might be a chance that that might be the case um and then the other thing was from very early on monitoring around footpaths roads and lanes obviously the birds as they're sort of nesting and prospecting become slightly habituated to that so i'm just wondering whether mm. you think there's any chance that there might be more further away from roads and lanes and that that nests might have been avoided or whether that might have had an impact on survival and you know hens leaving nests because of human disturbance you know it more so there than than on areas that aren't visible to to mm. lanes but sorry that was me yeah, i'll shut up but thank you I thought it was can, brilliant. Can, 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 uh, is it appropriate for me to answer that yeah. <laughs> those questions okay uh the the first thing yes the those blocks coincided with the onset of silage cutting in areas around our valley so they they clearly weren't birds from our project area but it was a, just a reflection of what happened so yes it did coincide with that um the other question that crossed my mind is do is why don't we see the females that desert at sort of four weeks, which is on average when they did leave the males in charge of the chicks uh, flocking. And I think probably, I, and I'd be interested to hear what you think, I think probably that's a, a reflection of the fact that they've developed this habit in order to go off and build up the reserves so they can lay four massive eggs the next season. And there's not much point in them hanging around the breeding area, wasting time. They may as well spend it with the chicks if they're going to do that. So they go straight away. They don't go to a, a, an area where they flock. So that that's just the business of the dispersal flocks. The other thing is uh, footpaths. Yes, um, it was a surprise to us that um, one of the, the nests was within 30, 30, 40 yards of the busiest footpath on our, on our project area. And this is a footpath I walk my dogs up it on a daily basis, and lots of other people do. Um, and they seem to choose that. 
Now, I wondered if it was because the presence of people and dogs was actually deterring predators like carrion crows that seem to have a much greater flight distance than curlews. Curlews can, can accommodate to farmers checking their sheep and that kind of thing very easily. And I think they habituate to people walking their dogs up a footpath as long as the dogs are on a lead. Um, but it may be that carrion crows are not as uh, comfortable in the presence of human beings, and they they use that. To, they regard that as a, a bone. The curlews regard that as a bonus. But I don't know. That's my only possible explanation. And there were one, two, three, three nests that I can think of that were I, either on footpaths or very close, like this one. So I don't know whether that's, is, I'm not sure what your question was about footpaths and roads, but. I think also um, in terms of the, the site, it's a very well, um, the infrastructure around the site and within the site in terms of, of roads, it's bounded and it, it and then you have like a cross of crossroads of roads throughout the, um, the entire project oh, yes. site. Right. So actually apart from very few small fields, yes, I would say probably 98% of the, project land can be surveyed from public rights way or from generally from metal roads really more than anything so there is an element of disturbance but not as much because a lot of them did it a lot of the surveys did it from cars as well but also if there was disturbance into further fields that would have been noticed yeah so it's uh, and then with regards to the um possible possibility of being a higher number of, of chicks that that could be a possibility there was one confirmed and then because of the age of the um of the broods through yeah based on behavior of adults through to them disappearing i have allocated those as a possible breeding a possible success but we couldn't see it because of the vegetation height unfortunately so we've i've used that i've used a class as a positive indicator rather than a negative yeah thanks for that and and yeah, across the country, getting a good metric of productivity <clears throat> in some landscapes is just really hard, particularly where you've got long, long sward, big fields. It's just mm -hmm. really difficult to do. Um, yeah, we definitely recognise that. Um, next up in terms of questions was Taya. Yes, Clive, sorry if I oh, missed this. Yeah. I, I was just interested, um, Clive and Jackie, um, and we can do this as a follow up after this, if that's all right with you. I'd be interested the land use for all the fields that you surveyed, but also whether there's adjacent land where potentially the adults and chicks could move in terms of feeding habitat, you know, whether there's adjacent um, graze land or land that's not cut as well. That was all. So it's not, it's not a, qu a question you say tonight, but when they would have the time and motivation perhaps to share that information. Yeah, territories were taken into account where obviously, because obviously Birds don't, yeah, align to to to, um, to human boundaries. But yeah, we did take into account the adjacent land and the crossover boundary uh, territories outside of the project area because we did actually have some birds who were displaced due to rolling and to cutting that then actually moved in and um, established their second nest with actually within the project boundary. So Earth also saying that we've got the chat function. Uh, so again, if you haven't seen it, uh, Mike Pollard has already put up a couple of comments. It's in the little toolbar at the bottom under chat. Uh, <laughs> as we're going along, if you want to ask a question or you think you might forget something, then pop it in there and we can come back to some of those later on. Um, just a couple more before we go on to the next talk. Uh, I think Kath was next. Yeah, sorry, I haven't seen the questions in the chat, so excuse me if they've already been asked, but um, it was two things really. The first was um, just on the presentation, you mentioned that the adults were taking two to three week old chicks into uncut uh, fields. To no, into, into cut fields. Yeah, sorry, sorry, to cut fields um, and then taking them back into the uncut fields. Correct. Uh, when they were taking them back into the uncut fields then, did were they posing any risk to sort of mortality? Were, were those uncut fields then getting cut and risking the chicks? Did that ever happen? Or, you know, it just <laughs> it's quite ironic, isn't it, that they take them into uncut fields, uh, cut fields to feed. Mm -hmm. Then when when they've sort of um, totally fed on the invertebrates and the grounds hardened, that they take them back into the uncut fields where then they stand a risk of the chicks actually getting mown down when the when the fields cut did that happen or is that just an observation 
the 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 fields where we observed the, this behavior um they we managed to persuade the farmer to hold off the cut of the field that they the nest right. field that they'd retreated into until they were clear but um, they could have been lost by going into other fields that were cut uh, earlier than the, the than the nest field actually was cut but i think it's probably it probably was predation but we can't be absolutely sure i don't think they got mowed out okay that's great and and the second thing just um i work for the lake district national park and i'm working on mm. um the fipple program um and it was just it was quite interesting when you said that birds were um being disturbed by other stocking in certain fields and i know some of our projects have um been around um field size reduction for sort of rotational grazing with livestock so it, it would be interesting to know sort of what stocking rates uh sort of minimal mm. stocking rates what causes disturbance and whether we should be actually talking a little bit more in depth with our farmers embarking on those projects to talk about rotation and potential uh curly recovery areas and what they should be avoiding and um you know that type of thing so it'd be interesting at we, some point we, to explore that a little yeah. bit further we couldn't establish precise stock numbers that weren't detrimental um, but um, the stocking level that didn't seem to cause any problem was very low. Um, cattle in even 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 small numbers were they're not not a good idea with curlews. But even so, we had um, a nest that successfully hatched, and uh, the chicks survived for a couple of weeks. Uh, that nested in a field that contained about half a dozen cows, but that was over an area of something like 20 acres. So it's very thin stocking. The, the stocking rate that, that messed up the curlews in, in, in the valley was something like, um, let's get it right, 75 ewes, each with twin lambs. So we're looking, and when the lambs grow, they're quite you know, they grow pretty fast. So I'm not talking about baby lambs. These are quite big fat lambs. Uh, so what's that? 7,500. That's over 200 in a 10 acre field. Mm. OK, thank you. Or a 10 to 15 acre field. Let's yeah. be truthful. Yeah. Thanks. The other thing that actually with the stocking as well, which displaced the birds is that we moved around, but quite often the fields were ranched as well within an area. So there were, yeah, you had high numbers, but obviously they were then moving around quite often within as a flock, or oh, yeah, near enough, yeah, dispersed as a flock from field to field. So there was constant display, yeah, disturbance and displacement over a number of fields at any one given time. Yeah, and, and typically those birds in the top northern part, we noticed that the birds didn't nest in the fields that appeared initially to be their choice. Uh, that's the fields that they spent most of their time in. Uh, but they were pushed in different directions by the movement of livestock and ended up being pushed against the territories of other pairs. So there was quite a lot of competition in some areas between pairs chasing other pairs away. Um, and that did make it quite difficult to pinpoint how many pairs there were and, 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 and all the rest of it. Right, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kath. Um, Matt, I'm going to come to you in a minute. If you could say a few words, that'd be brilliant. Uh, I've got Mike and then Mandy, and then I'm going to go to Matt, just say a little bit about the, the process. Um, so Mike first. Hi, thanks, Russ. Yeah, Mike Pollard here. I'm from the Upper Thames area, and we have a very similar situation, actually, so recognise uh, a lot of the, uh, the points that you've made. Um, also, just um, really stunned by the high density of pairs that you've got I mean you've got a higher density than we've got in any of our even our best sites so you you know you've obviously got a lot of good factors there in terms of really presumably really good habitat and at some stage in the recent past high productivity even if not at the moment so um, we do also find that productivity does vary a lot between years in different sites so that's something to to consider um, your nest hatching success to seem pretty amazing as well without any fencing um, and also for our area fox predation does seem to be a re really major major issue as, as has been found by a lot of other projects um, 
less so for us the impact of agriculture operations because a lot of our sites are in higher tier of agri environment and aren't cut until sort of mid uh sorry mid july but we do have some sites where we're getting the june cut as well and very similar issue with families of birds families of curlews being moved into cut fields just at the wrong time when the chicks are a week or two old because there's an awful lot of availability of food the cut grass seems a real attractant so that is a huge challenge for us and we actually with one pair this year we tried to successfully to nudge those chicks that family back out into long grass that that does work but it's quite labor intensive um, the main thing I'm really interested in actually through the through this sort of seminar actually is is the sort of compensation measures that are needed for farmers in terms of um, the delayed hay cuts, um, which seem to be so important and how we how we navigate through that. So uh, I don't yeah. know whether that's, there's time for that now, but as it's really a hopefully a theme going through this because that, that is so important because we've got to find ways of uh, having more delayed hay cuts or, or, or ways of protecting the chicks both from predation and those, those agricultural operations so it'd be really interesting to hear how your project goes next year but that's a great presentation thank you so can i just mention the high population um what we've noticed is, is that last slide was anecdotal evidence and i've i missed out the bit about them all in curlews they nest and fledge earlier than down in the valley now that seems strange to us because it's colder up there and we'd have thought that everything would have got started much later up in the up on the moorlands rather than down where we are um but we've we've got a video of um a chick that looks to be one to two weeks old running down a lane on the moorland um the top end of nidderdale on the what was it 27th of april so that chick must have been born about the first week in April, well, that means that, you know, it was being incubated from the beginning of March, um, which is much, it's about two weeks ahead of us. Uh, and the only thing I can think of is that on the moors, they have protection from predation by the gamekeepers, and they also have very few livestock to cope with. So they don't have the disturbance that our, our birds get at the beginning of the of the season. And I think that that's why ours uh, are breeding at a later date than the Moreland ones. And our population, I think, is coming from spillover from the Moreland birds. I don't think we're generating this population where we are. And I don't think, it's, I think we're unlikely to have ever been generating it. I could be wrong. I think it's coming from the Moors and then fizzling out in the valleys adjacent. Okay, uh, I'm going to come to Mandy and then I think Matt is going to say something about the um, farmer payment um, proposals and I know that at least one of the other talks later on is going to cover that as well so we will be covering that mic. Uh, Mandy, question from you. Um, in, uh, just trying to sort of answer some of those questions. I, um, Clive, nice to see you after <laughs> many conversations down the telephone. Yes, yeah. um, uh, uh, I think that um, my, my assumption would be as yours, it was a great surprise to me to know that the upland birds nested that uh, quite a lot earlier, actually, than the birds on the lower ground. But I think it must be because they have, uh, that they return to, to similar, very similar sites within a territory and they have the great positions. They're not doing what you've described your birds doing, which is looking around for the ideal site. Um, moving quickly on to stocking, I don't think there is a ratio. I think what you can get a feel for that because what those birds are looking for is to not be disturbed. That's sadly why so many of them nest in silage cults because they're looking for a field yeah, without stock. Right. They're looking yeah. for a sward that grows quickly. And what is that? That's that silage. That's a field that's shut up for silage. I mean, when um, and when you're seeing those chicks go out into um, cut silage, well, you know, the base is often wet, wetter, um, good foraging ground, and it's it's less of a challenge for small chicks to get into. But of course, they want the cover. Um, they want to go back into the cover, um, particularly at night, to be protected. So you do often see, I mean, you won't just see curlies, you'll see all sorts of birds foraging on that cut silage, which is a really good source of food and you're quite right the adults need to feed up as, as, as well as the chicks and I think 
there's so much research we need to do, but that's one of the things that I'm really interested in is what the adults' needs are alongside the ticks, because we find families traveling huge, huge distances. Um, in terms of um, advice for farmers and, and what they need to do, it, it is really di difficult, Clive. I saw your su su slide, which said that the earlier agricultural operations aren't such a problem for birds, and I agree. I don't think they are. Although if they go on for too long, we have had had birds abandon nests. Um, but uh, it, it, it's and and someone else um, mentioned it also depends on what's going on around because if if all your fields have been shorn, you've got nowhere, you've got no cover for those chicks. If everything's gone, nowhere to feed. Um, so that's a problem too. So it is actually bigger than the field and the cost is bigger than the loss of crop. Um, and of course, it's dependent on the farming system and it's dependent on whether the, the, the farm is actually feeding or filling in, in farming terms with, the, with their crop. Um, it's, it's the, you know, what they do with the aftermath, it's getting the contractor back in. So it will vary for every farm. Now, back in 2017, we did... Uh, we work with the farm business manager and the rates were so we have both beef and sheep and um, one or two dairy farms and the rates were between uh, 180 uh, per acre to 250 at the top at the, the de you know dairy farms are obviously much higher um, but we were finding that to save the chicks we needed to leave about 10 acres just to give you some sort of idea but it's it's from that evidence that you found that, that, that that's our way of thinking the our fields tend to be 10 10 11 up to 15 acres uh, the ones that they nest in and um, that allows us to mow fields adjacent fields mow away from the nest field and leave the nest field undisturbed as a refuge for cover and and uh, and then allow the chicks to feed on the uh, the swathes of stuff that's being cut. And then, of course, the, the cattle and sheep can move in and the chicks will cope with them once they're relatively mobile, i.e. probably about three to four weeks. That seems to be when the parents will take them into fields with livestock. Yeah. Up, 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 up our end, that's my, my experience. And, and back yeah. on what you're saying there, Amanda, which I know Matt will cover actually, is what we've discussed is actually looking at whole scale, at holding level, not, not field level, basically. So because obviously it is a landscape project and yeah, and nesting and habit the territories are landscaped rather than by you know, sort of artificial boundaries that we, we determine by our, our parcels. So what, as I say, Matt will go on to this, I imagine, we want to try and determine a a scheme that's pragmatic and easy to apply that doesn't actually tie farmers yeah that allows farmers to enter into it without actually and, and also continue with a, a viable business because that has to be yeah. it has to meet their criteria or otherwise we have we, we're on to a non-starter because whatever we decide and try to roll out it has to be able to be able to roll out at a larger scale than just the local level and it also has to leave a legacy to enable farmers to adopt that, that uh, management as and when funding starts to, to deplete. Sorry, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it there, Mandy, because we're unconscious of time. <laughs> I want to bring uh, Matt, can you just say a few words then about the <clears throat> proposed payment scheme? Because I think that'll be useful for some of the later speakers in particular. Hi, everybody. Yeah, no, very great pleasure to do so. I'll try and be quick. Um, I think it's a work in progress and I'm in discussion with all the other FIPL officers working on uh, projects, especially in the north of England, to come up with a payment rate. So I'll just say a few words based on my meeting with Jackie and Clive the other day uh, about the sort of thinking we're having. Um, I think the, the first problem is, is, is assessing how much is a curlew worth? You know, how do we, we have to base our payments to farmers in FIPL on actual cost, uh, because there isn't an equivalent curlew scheme, obviously, otherwise we'd be all be using it. Because um, in FIPL, you have to, you, you can't be seen to undermine a, an equivalent ELM scheme or an, an equivalent countryside stewardship scheme. So we have to use actual cost as our guide. So what, what are we costing? And um, we looked, at, we talked about with Clive and Jackie, the cost of silage bales, uh, et cetera. And, 
is that's quite tricky to work out. One of the things that you can look at is is field rent and um, uh, the seasonal field rent near us. I, I spoke to Joe Bonner from the Rural Business Research Unit, and uh, although I've still got to sort of uh, do a bit more research on this, it was around one hundred and fifty pounds a an acre uh, for in our area for um, field rent, uh, and that was for a six month period sort of April to September seasonal field rent and you could choose what you do with that you could put you can graze it or you can use it to cut silage um, but it's it's just grass in that period so I've based my uh, proposal on that um, to allow maximum farmer flexibility I think that's the key thing to get farmer uptake on this project you know we want to save chicks we want lots of farmers to take it up we need them to we need the payments to be good enough that uh, they're equivalent to what certainly as good as what they would pay uh, for that field rent in a sense what are they losing um and i think like mandy said actually probably ought to be better but the problem is we've got in fipple we've got to base it on actual cost we can't just target what's most attractive to farmers we can't sort of add extra money as a reward we've got to use actual cost which is a problem so the only way we can make it seem attractive is to assume that all our farmers are absolutely brilliant and they're going to get maximum productivity and they're you know they're highly efficient farmers and, and their rent on their fields is at the top end so we sort of have to use a top end rent that that was my thinking um i've divided it into three periods now early middle and late so i think like jackie said we if if you get a farmer on board uh, you've got the curlew officer working with him and you've established which fields are in uh, are territories for the breeding curlews so your early period april the 15th to may the 15th that first month you could receive payments on that but by may the 16th the curlews should have found a nest site should have chosen a nest field so you can free the other fields up from conditions so you, you start with a wide you know wide application of of conditions and uh by the middle period by the second month you've you've honed in on one field where those conditions are really critical and and i think that is attractive to farmers who need the silage um and i've also added a late period so a third the third month june the 16th to july the 15th uh, uh, to take account of the late cut of hay when you've got young chicks and you might even add another month to that if you had a, a late nest that you know so it's flexible and it um, frees up fields at the earliest pop possible opportunity this system and uh, we have to have a have a slightly different payment for the rough rough pasture which tends to be paid at 70 pounds an acre in our area so my actual cost payment was based on this for rough pasture being slightly less and most farmers have got a mixture in Darlybeck uh, catchment of rough pasture pasture and meadow so and we might add another payment for very high quality improved grassland that was for dairy farmers so you might distinguish that again but I wanted to try and keep it as simple as possible so for um yeah uh in I, I came to a, a per hectare figure of 30 pounds a, a month for rough pasture i've sort of slightly adjusted it to make the figures really really simple and and keep it and 60 pounds actually for pasture and meadow for one month uh, and i obviously the payments have uh, come with conditions and um, I started basing our stocking density on the UP2 figure, which is, is not 0.8 livestock units per hectare, but actually Clive thought that was too much. Um, so we came down to not 0.4 livestock units per hectare, which is five sheep with lambs per hectare, or two and a half cows per hectare. <laughs> so, um, and I think that's probably about right. That's about one sixth of the normal stocking rate. Uh, and the farming operations obviously that are being limited not spraying rolling harrowing topping applying lime applying fertilizer applying slurry or applying farming farmyard manure possibly with some 
feeding restrictions. I think that's open for debate and and possibly restricted use of quad bikes in the field and such like. So, um, but like I say, as soon as uh, the late period conditions for the pasture and the rough pasture, you can you can start to increase your stock numbers. That was our opinion uh, that from June the 15th onwards, the chicks were generally all big enough to cope with the increased stock numbers. And um, you were free to apply manure as well, possibly the, the young chicks could survive uh, a tractor driving and spreading manure, but they couldn't survive harrowing and uh, such like that were whole field sort of operations or rolling, but you perhaps could start to uh, do sort of some field operations. Matt, I'm going to pause you there. Yeah, um, there's also some really good chat going on. Uh, so if you haven't had a look at the chat yet, there's some quite detailed discussion in on this very topic, actually. Uh, so I'd encourage you to have a look at that and keep going on that in parallel. I will be trying to capture all of this and, and provide some summary, and I will be capturing the chat. I'm screen grabbing it as it goes along. So please keep putting things in there. But I do want to move on um, in the interest of time. So we are going to hop across to the Yorkshire Dales, and uh, I welcome Paul Noyes from the BTO. Uh, Paul, are you showing any slides? In which case, I'll hand over controls to you and you can share screen when you're ready. Okay, and then don't forget to unmute and it's all yours. Can you hear me? And can you see the slides? Is that all good? All good. Okay, yeah, well, thanks for us and good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, a tough talk to follow. It was absolutely um, yeah, amazing, but um, I'll do my best. And yeah, as Russ has already mentioned, my name is Paul Noyes. I work for the British Trust for Ornithology on improving breeding wader monitoring options for local wader projects and land managers. And this is directly related to the nature of the BTO and Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority FIPL project um, introducing to you tonight. Uh, which we've developed in two phases, imaginatively named phase one and phase two. And these are on two linked but um, separate themes regarding breeding waders and environmental land management oral. So uh, as has already been mentioned a lot tonight, um, there's a lot unknown about the future of elm in England, but um, it seems clear our best bet for curlew conservation in terms of elm, and to be frank, for curly recovery in general is going to be through the mid-level scheme, um, local nature recovery. Uh, this is the scheme most equivalent to countryside stewardship, which is going to be making management changes at the farm or site level. Um, but what will be key to uh, the success of LNR or elm more widely is Firstly, the information feeding into the design of the schemes, which again, has been a lot of discussion around tonight, um, which of course needs to be driven primarily um, by farmers and other land managers, but strongly supported by the science. Uh, but secondly, and crucially, um, what is often forgotten is the monitoring of the outcomes of any management options um, undertaken by land managers. And without adequate monitoring, uh, we simply can't say that anything we're doing is having the intended effect, um, i.e. improving uh, poor breeding success um, we we know is um, driving declines so if it's working right this is uh, this all builds a positive management and monitoring feedback loop that will be essential to uh, the success of LNR and Elm more widely but as has been mentioned as well tonight um, bird monitoring in the UK is dependent on a limited supply of um, skilled bird watchers and ornithologists which and they should be allowed to go on holiday occasionally um, and this is obviously extremely costly um, and it's largely for this reason that agri-environmental schemes in the past have not included dedicated proactive monitoring of outcomes that have come in the form of retrospective or intermittent studies um, of their their impacts on bird populations. And on top of this, which has always, always also had quite a lot of talk tonight, is um, obviously for curlew and other waders that have long-lived birds. And it's crucial we assess the outcomes of any management options in terms of productivity or breeding success, as well as abundance. Um, but as has also been discussed, measuring um, productivity is really labor-intensive and tricky to do. Um, again, increasing costs to administers of agri-environmental schemes. So at the BTO, we've long believed that we can develop methods and upskill farmers and other land managers to include them more directly in the, uh, the monitoring monitoring outcomes of their management and provided they're adequately adequately compensated for any extra work asked for them um, including farmers in the monitoring of curly and other waders would be a triple win uh, because the financial and carbon costs of land managers monitoring their own land would be much less than bud surveyors traveling to site 
Secondly, the active monitoring itself further engages land managers with um, curlew and wader conservation. And finally, land managers contributing directly to an evidence base would further build the trust between stakeholders in curlew and wader conservation. And this would make the debate around the future of land management in the UK more constructive and evidence focused. So uh, to summarize, phase one of our project, which started this year, um, aims to address this need to provide cost-effective and inclusive options for wader monitoring on farmland by trialing a wader survey method um, developed to fit around farmers' work duties called the wader calendar, as well as promising new bioacoustics technology um, using devices called AudioMOFs and comparing these to traditional wader surveys on um, participating farms. And for phase two of the project, um, we aim to improve the information available to DEFRA and Design Now options uh, by catching and GPS tagging 20 um, adult breeding curlew across a range of location in the Yorkshire Dales. And this is to assess uh, in detail some of the stuff that's been discussed again um, tonight and the habitat use and breeding success of curlew in these landscapes to get maybe a bit of empirical data around a lot of the qualitative um, knowledge that's in the um, room tonight. But um, we're especially keen to examine this in relation to silage and using this ecological research um, and land manager consultation with the participants to provide practical recommendations around um, ELM options in the future. Uh, so through both of these phases, we'll support farmers and other land managers to have their say on the feasibility of both the initial design of ELM options and the subsequent monitoring of um, the outcomes of the management. And we plan to do this with a combination of questionnaires and workshops built into the programme throughout. So to go back to what we've begun this year in phase one, I'd like to just introduce the um, the way to Canada briefly. This scheme has its roots in work undertaken by the BTO and land managers looking at uh, what's possible for farmers to fit around their work duties whilst still providing scientifically useful information about breeding wader abundance and productivity. It is a really simple unstructured survey um, in which we ask farmers to keep mental or written notes of the waders they see um, when out and about on the farm and to summarize that at the end of each week by providing an estimate of the total count um, they've seen number of birds displaying and a number alarm calling or with chicks for the five target wader species um, doing their best not to double count uh, birds and just obviously counting for that week alone and this survey has been trialled in Scotland and increasingly England from 2020 to 2022. Uh, previous year's data has shown a great amount of promise. We've derived sensible estimates of pairs per kilometre squared from the counts, but perhaps uh, more excitingly, uh, the patterns of chick rearing behaviour recorded by farmers seem to be reflective of what we'd expect is happening on the ground. As a uh, graph from the report last year, um, which shows the mean counts of um, apparently chick rearing curlew. So that's birds observed repeatedly alarm calling or with young um, from the 13 participating farms in 2021 that had breeding curlew on their farm. And we've superimposed the vertical lines um, representing mean incubation start um, and hatch date and fledge date, which was derived from ringing and nest record scheme. Um, data. And as you can see, they show a relatively neat pattern of activity that we'd expect um, with farmers recording more alarm behaviours than chicks increasingly towards mean hatching, um, then consistently across the chick rearing period, but then dropping off uh, after fledging. And to demonstrate that's not an artifact of uh, survey timings or anything like that, it's the same graph for um, an earlier breeding wader lapwing. Um, and as you can see, we've observed a similar pattern with that. Um, Unfortunately, with the sample sizes, we couldn't investigate how these patterns vary between farms of expected low and high productivity. That would have been really interesting. Um, and yeah, we're not trying to oversell these data. As I said, this is an unstructured survey and its power to detect differences in abundance and productivity is going to be limited. However, as an extremely cost-effective um, option, possibly added to by other monitoring options or local wader projects, um, it could make a really strong contribution to monitoring the effectiveness of ELM options at the sample sizes we'd be expecting from um, a national local nature recovery scheme. So, in terms of other monitoring options um, that could contribute to this monitoring on farmland, one promising bit of kit is the audio moth, as I've already mentioned. Um, they're lightweight sound recorders, only 58 millimeters long and 80 uh, grams, including the batteries. And they're going for around $80 a piece um, nowadays. So we're talking well within the realms of agri-environmental uh, budgets. Um, and once deployed on a site, audio moths can passively record 
whatever is making noise around them for long periods of time. And obviously waders are very noisy birds and the calls they make are related to the behavior and the stage of breeding they're at. So it raises the exciting possibility that the, the prevalence and the nature of different wader calls that these devices record could be used to derive estimates of abundance and breeding success, whether deployed either independently or augmenting uh, traditional monitoring. And this is an imagined field um, of research from the BTO, but more widely in the UK, notably through the PhD research of David Jarrett at Durham University, who we owe a lot to in terms of advice and guidance for the project. So to give an overview of phase two, we had 12 farms who signed up um, to the project at the beginning of the year. And on each farm, we designated specific study areas, which were chosen for their importance for curlew and other waders. And we asked farmers to keep weekly counts using the wader calendar method in those study areas and to deploy audio MOF um, recorders in those areas in late April and pick them up again at the end of July. So crucially, both these asks only equate to really a handful of hours. Obviously, it depends a bit on how keen the um, surveyor is, but um, it's really only a handful of hours across the spring and summer. So it's a pretty lightweight ask. And uh, and as I've mentioned as well, these um, areas were surveyed by local YDMPA volunteers using traditional wader census surveys. Um, so to put really put the cost effectiveness of the methods we're trying to test and its feasibility for wider elm monitoring, we decided to take a relatively light touch in terms of input. So we provided an introductory email sent to paper pack with the relevant materials, including the audio MOF devices themselves, and hosted two, two Zoom sessions um, outlining what was required and a bit of background about the behaviors we're looking for with the um, target wader species. And we also followed up individually on the phone with all but two of the participants. But other than that, we are relatively hands off throughout the process. Um, uh, and, you know, in terms of the farmers making the weekly counts and um, deploying their audio moths. And as far as we're aware, this makes the project relatively unique in that respect. So to show you a bit more about the setup of the audio moths, um, Following the advice of audio moth researchers, we placed the recorders in a waterproof bag with silica gel. Um, it's a pretty standard process, taped it securely to a small piece of wood, which made it a bit easier for um, the deployment, which we've termed on audio mothsicle. Uh, and we also provided a cable tie, um, so farmers could attach to fence posts. Obviously, you know, farmers have cable ties themselves, but uh, just to give demonstrating here. Uh, they, they can be attached to a fence post or lodged into a dry stone wall. Um, and then we provided uh, prepaid envelopes. So it was all a really streamlined process of taking, picking them up at the end of the year. And then um, if you remember where they are, which was a bit of feedback from some of the farmers, um, and then popping them in envelopes and sending that back. Um, and that was really it for the ask for the phase one in 2023. Um, and it's still early days, but to report back on preliminary findings so far, 10 out of the 12 farmers engaged with the project, um, either, you know, completing waiter calendars or deploying the audio moths, which given this is an entirely voluntary project whose start date did unfortunately coincide with peak lambing in the dales, um, it's not too bad going. Uh, we've downloaded and run automated classification on the audio moth recordings, um, and we've got lots of waiter activity on these recordings, but it's too soon to summarize um, it meaningfully in terms of the value, um, in terms of the amounts or value of its value in estimating abundance of productivity. Uh, we did get quite a high rate of attrition um, for the audio moth devices. So three of the 10 audio moths were damaged um, during deployment. But interestingly, a lot of the data remained fine um, where what the equipment and the devices themselves were damaged. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, we chose we chose not to go with protective cases with this um, in this year, uh, but just based on uh, advice from other researchers. But the, given the fact that this is, you know, you're asking a farmer managing an active farm to deploy them rather than uh, the researcher doing it directly, it's possible that, you know, the, the protective cases are needed in these circumstances, which we'll do in 2023. Um, there's also quite a fair amount of variability in the completeness in the returned wader calendars compared to um, general participants in previous years. Um, phase one had a pretty tight turnaround when um, funding was confirmed uh, in late April, which I've already mentioned was coincided with peak lambing in the Dales. So um, we couldn't feasibly run in-person training sessions and that need for better training has been key, key 
feedback from participants so far as well so that said we still felt it was worth getting things off the ground in 2022 and we've um, now got a good base of active participants who have trialed uh, these methods and um, we've got a much better understanding of feasibility because of that and um, yeah they're engaged um, despite the issues highlighted they've responded overwhelmingly positively and going into the autumn and winter we'll begin the analyses proper and begin um, dialogue with the these farmers about future elm options and their experiences with weighted calendars and audio moths and the feasibility of these methods in future elm projects and of course we'll run the in-person training um, in 2023 well in advance of spring and lemon um, another strand of research we'd like to pick up in 2023 was along the lines of the farm research but monitoring on estates um, gamekeepers comprising the Yorkshire Dales Moreland group have been undertaking weighted transects in the Dales since uh, 2017 and we'd like to assess their use for potential use for elm and wider regional monitoring so hoping to pick that up again in 2023 and then finally just to um, quickly cover phase two of the project as well to remind you this was about increasing our knowledge of the fine scale habitat use and um, breeding success of curlew in the dales and similar farmland and moorland um, more widely with a particular focus on silage as has been mentioned a lot tonight um, in order to inform the design and implementation of these um, ELM schemes. So again, to do this, we're um, proposing to catch and tag 20 uh, wild adult curlew using leg loop harness GPS transmitters as the photos um, show here. And half of these tags funded by the FIPL problem program, half will be funded by the VTO. And um, we also hope to provide the wider public um, in the Yorkshire Dales with up-to-date movement to the track birds in the national park where, where landowners consent to it um, to engage them in themes of curly conservation. Uh, and once we've undertaken both years of field work, we plan to run workshops for the participants and local land managers involved to contribute to um, the development of recommendations uh, and we'll collate the information we take from the land manager consultation and the supporting ecological research to make uh, key recommendations to DEFRA, um, especially in relation to silage. And yeah, uh, I'd like to make a call, obviously, with the other projects present tonight, would be very open and keen to make to making these recommendations collectively, as I know silage is a key theme. Um, and from what I've gathered so far, we have the potential to be largely complementary in our findings and put maybe a stronger case to DEFRA if they do um, listen, um, which again, credit has to go to Russ and CRP for organising this and making that kind of thing possible. but. That, I think, is me. So, yeah, thanks for listening. If you have any questions on the methods I've outlined, um, obviously ask now or get in touch at waders.bta.org. And finally, I'd like to thank all the, obviously, the Phase 1 participating farmers, Ian Court and his team at the YDMBA, David Jarrett, and again to Russ and CRP for organising the seminar. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, it's worth saying that part of the reason of bringing everyone together tonight is so the CRP can collate some of the learnings from this first year and what's going on at the minute and feed that back into DEFRA you know with the caveat I say there's a lot going on in DEFRA at the minute as we're all aware um but the intention is is that we want to be able to you know coordinate and clay activity and feed that back into to policy makers um hopefully with positive outcomes for for the future realms programs um it's a question from Ben in the chat over what range do the audio moths pick up um bird calls and over what distance would you need devices to be spaced to prevent overlap of birds but to get good coverage if you're creating a baseline across the farm it's a really good question and that's part of the part of that's a question we'd like to address with this really I, I don't think that's been comprehensively answered and it's quite a it's surprisingly tricky question to answer but um we're that can be approached that wouldn't it be within the realms of this um project but if you'd look at kind of hyperbolic arrays which is basically just having multiple um audio moth devices within an area and then if they have the gps locks as well um you can start to look at detection ranges and and pinpoint actual calls and things like that but without um uh, yeah without observations in real time of distances of birds that are calling it would be very difficult and probably beyond the realms of this but um we'd like to potentially address that but that's a long, very long-winded way of saying I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a researcher saying we need more research. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of hands. We do need to make up a bit of time. So again, please use the chat if you've got other questions for Paul. And I say we will hopefully have a bit of time at the end just for any wrap-up questions. But I would like to move to Barney. Uh, and Barney, you are going to be between uh, everyone and a cup of tea or a beer top-up. 
Um, but yeah, we will have a, a, a little comfort break after after Barney's presentation. So we're now moving to the Southern Lakes. And if you want to start sharing screen, make sure you're unmuted and it's over to you when you're ready. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Um, it's Barney Sykes and Susanna Bleakley here. Um, so talking about our South Lakes Curlew Recovery Project. Um, if I can persuade it to go down a slide, hang on. Ah. If it's easier, come out of slideshow and just do it in normal mode. Yeah, and yeah. It works. I think I've got it. I don't know if that looks okay from your perspective. Um, yeah, got the first slide. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're we're based in the South Lakes. Um, there's a sort of central area which is the Lithe Valley, um, which is an area of lowland grassland, uh, mainly silage fields, um, some limited wetlands. Um, very many farmers um, owning the land. So we've got a lot of different landowners that we're working with. Um, there's also a surrounding area of, um, of sort of keen volunteers in South Lakes that we're also covering, but the sort of central focus is the Live Valley. Um, so the project is entirely volunteer led um, and it's working with um, you know, about 30 farmers across the farming community, landowners, contractors. Um, and it, we start with a curlew survey day um, around the 19th of April. Um, it's a time when the curlews have, have paired up but haven't started nesting yet quite. Um, and I think there's a, we get a bunch of volunteers on that day to walk the highways and byways um, around here and, and document um, the waders that they see. Um, and that helps, I mean, I think we had 16 territorial pairs um, in our valley uh, this year and last year. Uh, not quite the same 16, but um, 16 territorial pairs in both, both this year and last year. Um, there's a huge follow-up effort after Curlew Survey Day with um, engaging with the farmers who own the land and um, finding, protecting and monitoring the nests. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in and out of a lot of people's farmyards, getting permission to ac access land, um, getting permission to uh, fence nests and all that sort of thing. Um, there's targeted crow control. Um, foxes are dealt with by the farmers to an extent. Um, we have seen foxes on our trail cams, um, but I think, yeah, so we do some targeted crow control around um, the nests that we find. Uh, we're not going to change the population of crows in the valley, I don't think, but we can be fairly specific. Um, we seem to be reasonably good at protecting nests from badgers, from foxes, from sheep and from crows, as long as we found them early enough. Um, we've had examples this year and last year where we found a nest, we go off to get permission from the farmer to fence it, and by the time we come back, the fox or the badger has got it. Um, but if we can get in and, and protect it, we seem to be okay. Um, as with most people, we struggle to monitor and protect chicks once hatch. Um, we lose chicks into silage mowers, um, I, and it gets into the realms of speculation what happens to some of them, but um, we don't get a lot of positive sightings of chicks. Um, we've had at least one fledged this year um, out of, so we found, I think this year, just to give you some numbers, uh, 16 territorial pairs, um, six nests found with 24 eggs, 10 chicks, and one definite fledge, possibly more, um, but it's difficult once they're mobile. Um, the farmers have been amazing. Um, the, you, I mean, the, I think we've dealt this year with about 30 different farmers and landowners, and they're all positive. They're all ringing up and saying, what about this? You know, have you seen this one? Um, you know, and recording their sightings. And it's... Um, it's the, the engagement's been excellent. Um, um, so the FIPL grant um, was done in March, sort of end of March, beginning of April, um, basically for three things. Um, we've got um, 4G cameras um, with large batteries, um, which enable us to monitor nests from, from the comfort of our own homes. Um, so the, the pictures come onto the, onto the mobile phone and you can see what's happening on a nest and um, that's super useful. Um, 
the Fibble Grand also provided electric fences um, with large batteries. So in previous years, we've you know, had to swap batteries out, you know, halfway through a season and things. But with significant batteries, we put the fence up and then we can largely leave it alone, except for maybe a bit of strimming. Um, and we were installing um, uh, eye button temperature loggers, both in the nest and an ambient logger just outside the nest, which you can then record the temperature in the nest and outside the nest every 10 minutes. And you can get a fairly accurate um, picture of when she's sitting or when he's sitting and when, um, when he's not. Um, the, in terms of costs, um, it was, the, the, the bid was for 5,000 quid. And as I say, we got electric fences, eye buttons, cameras. Um, Crow traps weren't approved. We had crow traps in there, but I think the, def, the, the message from DEFRA was um, it's still a sensitive issue and that we shouldn't be encouraging non-lethal methods of predator control. Um, so that bit wasn't approved, but um, the rest was super useful. Um, and I don't, it hasn't necessarily been mentioned on the call. Um, in order to apply for a FIPPLE grant, you need to be a, a farmer with an SBI number. Um, so we, we have, I have a little bit of land in the valley and so that enabled that to happen. But the, the project is in a, on a much wider scale than my land. Um, so future, I mean, I think we're looking at a Curlew Head Starting Scoping Study. Um, so we're gonna be submitting this bid shortly. We wanna have a look at what we can do to ensure the survival of um, the Curlews around here. Um, we've got very low, uh, fledging rates. Um, so we want to, and the words are there, um, appraise the options to conserve our breeding population, um, particular focus on head starting. So we're going to do a scoping study around that if we get the, uh, the grant approved. Um, we haven't submitted that yet, but that's in the list. Um, and we've got lots of ambition, um, digging scrapes in the valley. I'm very interested in what people were saying about the elms and FIPPLE um, farmer compensation that would be super useful. Um, uh, we've, we've looked at community gamekeepers, potential for um, conducting predator control in the valley, um, possibly need future funding for head starting. Well, let's have a look at that. Um, ornithological support, as I say, we're entirely volunt volunteer led at the moment. Um, so it would be useful to get more feet on the ground and paying some ornithologists that we know would be useful. Um, um, and that was it really, quite a short presentation. Hopefully we can gain some time. Um, any questions? Thanks, Barney, that's great. I've just put a note, uh, um, a bit droll, but yeah, if you haven't already, just engage Natural England at the earliest opportunity in any head starting uh, proposals. They're the licensing body um, and it's important they're engaged at the earliest opportunity to give them the best chance of understanding what it is that's being being proposed. We, we have um, We have a, very supportive letter from Natural England. Good, good, good. Uh, Matt, question from you. I, ju I just wanted to, uh, uh, brilliant presentation. It sounds like a great project. I'm uh, just speaking as a FIPL officer in Nidderdale. Uh, you can be the lead applicant in a FIPL project. You simply have to be working in partnership with a landowner. You don't need to be a landowner yourself. Uh, you know, so a charity or an organisation or any individual can apply and be the lead as long as you're working in partnership with the landowner. And actually, that landowner doesn't need to be registered with the RPA. Um, so they don't necessarily need to have an SBI number, I don't think, as long as it's not a, um, a domestic garden, you know, that, that we can even it, it's, it could be a smallholder who hasn't registered their land. But you need to have the partnership of all the farmers who probably will have SBIs. But okay, interesting. Thanks, Matt. Now, there's a common thread coming out here in terms of the challenges of measuring productivity, and and obviously some of the things that Paul's been talking about. Some of the innovation is key, but a lot of it ultimately is down to getting experienced bodies on the ground for long enough that they can um, manage that. But it is a challenge. But that is the metric. Yeah, by which we generally gauge success because these are long-lived birds they can be very unproductive but a persistent population or you can act as a sink for birds that are coming in from elsewhere um so that's something to think about while we go and grab a cup of tea in a minute um the other one is yeah we are focusing very much on curlew here but 
Yeah, I remember James Phillips was on our steering group and he's um, you know, moved on to a senior role in Natural England and, and uh, we've got Richard Saunders now. But I remember James, you know, a very pertinent quote saying that, you know, silage fields in effect are a sink for all life. You know, it's not just ground nesting birds, you know, curlew, breeding waders, skylarks, etc. Um, but, but you know, big impacts on general biodiversity and, and ecosystem services. So, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to think about, and we may have time later in the session or in the chat, you know, those projects that are running or applying, how much are you also bigging up the other ecosystem service and, and biodiversity benefits of your projects? And, and is that something that you felt you were being assessed on? I think that'd be a good one to cover off in the chat if you get a chance. Uh, before we break, I'm just going to go to Mike for a question and then Catherine. So Mike first. Hi, thanks. Yeah, um, I was just in very interesting presentation. Great work. Um, we, we're in a similar position here in the Upper Thames of very much sort of volunteer led, but we do have uh, quite a lot of professional sort of, uh, conservation sort of input as well from Natural England and RSPB and the Wildlife Trust. So it's quite a mixed mixture. Um, I'm interested that you're considering head starting because we've we've sort of sort of not gone down that direction um, because we believe we've still got a sustainable population. We've got about 50 pairs, though some of our some of our population is quite scattered. Um, but we're really focused on, you know, addressing the real causes of curly decline in terms of, you know, net productivity um, in the same way as you with nest protection. But I think we really got to focus on on the measures in terms of habitat management for chick rearing. And you mentioned um, predator control. We're, we're, I think this year we really realised more than ever the importance of fox control and the impact of, that fox is having particularly, uh, well, at all stages really. So I think um, just, yeah, that was that just a reflection, really. And, and um, this debate about head starting, whether to do it or not, is one that will, will run and run, no doubt. But um, I think, you know, in terms of the long term sustainability, you know, the sort of work we do, the projects are doing, looking at a solution to, you know, the grassland management and the predation issues are really, really key. So I'd, I'd very much sort of urge you to continue down those routes as well. No, I think I think that's that's good advice, and I think it fits in with what we're thinking. I think Natural England are keen that we pursue both both tracks in terms of um, doing what we're doing with the current population in terms of um, protecting nests, et cetera, et cetera, but also look at the head starting and see if that's a feasible option. Thanks. Yeah, and it's it's worth saying the CRP. Yeah, we are interested in looking at mechanisms for predator control in various methods being uh, delivered as part of future agri-environment schemes, because for curlew, it's going to be so integral uh, to success or failure in many um, areas. Uh, and obviously, Barney, you've, you've you know, um, uh, had that, you know, feedback from DEFRA that they're not prepared to fund it under FIPL. That's the same under existing um, agri-environment schemes. But if, if that's the line in things like local nature recovery tier of ELM, it is going to be very challenging when that is going to have to be a, a, a key component of curly recovery in, in many areas. So that is something that we are going to be working um, hard at and, and talking about with DEFRA. Um, Catherine, question from you. Hiya, um, I'm a conservation advisor in the Forest of Bolin for the RSPB. Um, so we've been doing similar stuff as all of you guys. Great work with all of your wader surveys. Um, I'm just interested in the kind of camera setup that you had on the nests. So it's really interesting that you had these cameras that you could watch from home. We kind of have these like the same kind of style trail cameras, um, but have been quite nervous to put them next to nests and potentially attract predators to the you know drawing any attention to nests we've been quite nervous about so yeah I'm just interested interested to hear how you've gotten on with them and how many nests you put them on and things. Um, this year we had them on five nests and none of those were predated um, so yeah and it's successful it's not it's not live footage but when when she moves it takes a, it takes a photo basically mm. so you can yeah, if, the, if there's a predator there, then you'll get a picture of it. If there's, um, you know, and you can monitor it. If they're hatching, you can, if you're lucky, and it's not too deep down in the silage because the silage gets really deep. Um, but if you're lucky, so yeah, it's it works really well in terms mm. of monitoring without without interfering. 
And have you thought about the possibility of using thermal imaging cameras to try and locate chicks or anything like that for, no. I mean, we're all struggling with we, trying we to have, find chicks once they hatch. We, we have um, used thermal imaging cameras to an extent. Mm. Um, I guess we used it this year at the end when, when we were struggling the grass grew super quick this year. It was warm, mm. warm and wet, and that was a, a challenge for us. And we used thermal imaging cameras a little bit. Um, I confess we didn't have any success with it. It doesn't mean it's not a good technology and I wouldn't try it again. It just, this year, I mean, it, they can't see through grass, you know, they, yeah. they, they're not. Um, so I, I think it's got, it's got legs, it could work, but, um, um, yeah, it's, it's something for next year. We'd certainly like to try it some more. What it did do for us was increase the population of hares in the valley significantly, but um, they're very expensive, the, those sorts yeah. of cameras. Um, the other thing I would say, Catherine, is the conversations you're having, we've had all of those conversations, we've agonised about any kind of interference close to curlew nests such mm. as putting fences, is that, are we interfering? Should we leave them to, to their own devices? We think we've come down on the side that not in every case, in different landscapes and different fields, there may be different answers, but we do feel that we have helped protect nests with fences. And we do feel that there's an added advantage to the cameras in that it gives us footage. It gives us sort of quite intimate domestic footage of the birds. And that has been hugely useful in mm. hearts and minds so as we're in the valley talking with landowners talking with silage contractors etc talking with um, farmers we can get out our phones and we can show them the latest pictures or a piece of footage from nearby and it it makes such a difference to the way people are understanding how the birds are behaving and in fact there's so much more that we'd like to do as with everything you just end up with more questions we, we had we had one one of our nests was on a, a farm with two young or three young children and the farmer found it and we're all super excited and they had the camera set up and the kids were amazed and you know it's we've got three three young farmers there that will be curly passionate forever i think um you know just from being intimate with these birds yeah, yeah. And the fact those were going to the farmers whatsapp group and that sort of thing mm. thank you Bob, thank um, you one more quick question from mandy Sorry, apologies. Um, just, to, just to say, there was a study, um, Paul might know more, um, I think it, I, it may have been a BTO or an RSPB study on lapwing, which looked at um, cameras and uh, up on nests, and um, the results were that there wasn't an effect. But of course, if you, put, if you do put a camera or a fence up, you must see the bird back on the nest from a safe distance every time. And if, if in the, on the rare occasion that a bird doesn't go back, you run in and get the kit out immediately. Which, which is also helpful when you've got a camera on it. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Good, good, good plan, the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks guys. That was a really good first session. Let's go and grab a uh, cup of tea, have a comfort break. Can we all come back and be ready to go at uh, 8.15, please? So five minutes. Um, thanks very much for that first session and see you in five minutes.